and the speakers Simone de Gennaro, University of Casino Italy, Marco Antonio Olivato, uh, YMCA Brazil, Karen Kiohan, Girls Sports Program, United Kingdom, Alan Williams, Sports for Social Change Network, Southern Africa, Africa. We, are, we pass the floor on now to the moderator, Elizabeth. Good afternoon. It's with the great pleasure that we begin now uh, parallel session number four that has as a theme action developing the voluntary sector through sports for all, through sports for all and at sports for all. So uh, in this afternoon, we have our uh, guests here that will bring great contribution to our discussion on this uh, political theme. Uh, and I think it's indispensable for the development of work in several uh, sectors that uh, work in sports for all, having uh, differences in uh, several countries, and within each country, uh, differences within sectors of society that work with voluntary work. Uh, uh, recruiting, formation, uh, education, the follow-up and motivation for these volunteers, their uh, recognition for the work and uh, legal matters that have to be taken into consideration. In this uh, panel, we will be able to know several experiences that have been brought in through our in invited guests from four different countries, Brazil, United Kingdom, um, Italy, in the United Kingdom. They will bring us new information and inspiration to find new ways and strategies to act in voluntary work. Uh, to begin our session, we will have uh, we will have four speakers with 20 minutes each, and following, we will open for questions and answers. You can write down your questions and hand them in to our staff that will collect them, and at the end, we will have 20 more minutes for a session of uh, questions and answers. Uh, to begin this panel, I invite Marco Antonio Elevato from YMCA Brazil. He is responsible for general programs in Sao Paulo and physical education from YMCA federations in Brazil. He is um, graduated in physical education and executive MBA in marketing, coordinates the area of physical education for the uh, Latin American Alliance and Caribbean of YMCA and CRF4. Uh, Marco, the floor is yours. Por favor, pode colocar o PowerPoint. E o controle... Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here right now, uh, being able to share with you uh, a theme of extreme relevance. I say this uh, in the personal matters because I work for 28 years in YMCA in Sao Paulo, and I can tell you that voluntary work has leveraged my career a lot. Uh, even after uh, um, graduating from physical education and through several activities and 
passing through several institutions, I was able to identify myself in YMCA due to several situations, due to my history, but especially due to volunteer work, which contributed a lot. We're talking now uh, quickly of uh, 110 years of history of an institution, uh, generally voluntary, that began and was idealized and con uh, through voluntary work. We, we have a mission, which is very important, and that is very characteristic and identified, uh, identifiable with voluntary work. You can see that in our view, we see the internationalization of our institution and YMCA, Young Men Christian Association, an institution with over 150 years, we can see this long, uh, further on, but the presence of voluntary work that turns uh, into something so big that in a certain point we began to have a, a professional structure to command or to help align ideas together with the volunteers. This mission and this vision is constituted by uh, voluntary people. Their participation is intense. Just a little bit of what we are here. We are 12 sports units as in an institution in the third sector sector. We have worked uh, a lot. We have uh, achieved our goals and budgets. We have our revenues. And part of this, we project to social work. So uh, it's something that has been strengthened strengthened é, through our volunteers. We are present in, for uh, 168 years é, in the world, in 119 países, countries, in all continents, 45 million participants. I bring you these numbers so that you can understand the dimension of the beginning of a voluntary work that has begun uh, 168 years old. In Sao Paulo, we have 50,000 associates. A little bit of our social work about our figures uh, that are served through part of the contribution of our associates within the institution and supported with uh, lots of voluntary work. Our pride and our pioneering, we are uh, started in football, uh, basketball, we are very proud for each moment that our institution went through, uh, creating situations in which we can reunite uh, thousands of people. And just to give you a, a more of an idea of this institution, we are worldwide uh, 12 uh, universities, some of them in physical education. We have teachers in four sports. I have uh, mentioned three of them. We are in 119 countries, uh, three Nobel Prizes. We had a volunteer that were two Nobel Prizes, sorry, uh, from the Red Cross. She was a volunteer from the Red Cross. And this time of existence, 168 years. On top of this, uh, of what I have mentioned, I would like to show you a bit of the dimension of the insti institution YMCA world and why we are in a very optimistic uh, time in our institution at the national level. I had a meeting on the YMCA federations. We are here in, we were able to unite 30 international movements here. We had a me meeting and the optimism that uh, we received uh, for being an institution, a worldwide institution to host these two great events on the next years. Uh, the FIFA World Cup and the Olympic Games. Um, many YMCA people will be here in Brazil. And where, where does the story begin? to generate a whole sequence of volunteer work so that we can take these people during the World Cup and the Olympic Games. So today,
Os the volunteer groups CIMI, from YMCA are characterized é, in several areas adultos, for youngsters, masters adults, também. masters. We will be estamos um modelo we will have de model of hospitality of uh, this, these people from uh, worldwide YMCA uh, to be a volunteer is an easy task let me just uh, pass along some of my experience I cannot uh, assume a, a, a role if I am not supported by a council of volunteers very multidisciplinary disciplinary volunteers to give support of the dimension of YMCA St. Paul. And I'm very glad to be able to uh, count with these volunteers, this uh, approximation as facilitators, for you to have an idea. The president of the Division of General Programs is vice president of City Club from the state of São Paulo. So these are things that make it easier, the, the, the daily work for us to be uh, 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 on our optimistic tra trajectory Bom, that uh, is happening now. There's no way to make it easier, your work, as to develop the uh, volunteer work without having goals and history being aligned with uh, what will sensibilize people. A YMCA is an institution that is very interesting because uh, due to an uh, equilateral triangle model, it can transmit an equality in, uh, in the area uh, body, soul, and mind. That we relate uh, spirituality with sports and culture. So this uh, approximates the uh, volunteer work uh, with YMCA Brazil. The YMCA is uh, originally voluntary, totally inspired by volunteers uh, 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 along these 168 years of existence. If you uh, want to understand a little bit better what YMCA is, us Brazilians, we uh, are very, uh, we are, we are very sports people. Uh, we have uh, camps, hotels, cultural centers, uh, restaurants. So it's very diversified. It depends of the characteristics of the community, uh, our characteristics characteristics. Here in Brazil is in sports, which originates from uh, the United States. And with the growth of YMCA, the need for uh, more professionals. Uh, a symbol of our presentations that we use is the uh, plane, airplane with two engines. Uh, one is the volunteer and the other is the professional. The professional also always has the responsibility of his uh, hard uh, the volunteer and the professional with the knowledge the understanding of the institution uh, makes this balance and this approach this is the model of work and this is the way we develop our professionals uh, just to give you an idea of volunteer, you have to act spontaneously or of your own will. This is the observation we have to do at the moment that we are approaching or structuring a voluntary work. Without these characteristics, hardly we, uh, we you'll have many difficulties and a long time to obtain results. But, so we have to have this perception. The professional, uh, all the, uh, the responsibility he has, all the knowledge, he, technical knowledge he has, and collaboration and cooperation are two words that we understand are very important. This is the idea we have to sell with all the access that we have. Uh, and to have collaboration, you have to have identification. You have to identify yourself with the voluntary work and the, also the community in which you um, are working with. Uh, the story of YMCA with volunteers, I take this as a recommendation. We have several classes in YMCA, uh, several units, several sports, fitness, wellness, uh, weightlifting. We have to be this way to be successful 
useful with the institution because you have to survive this war or this competitiveness of a market, very optimistic market, which is very difficult to survive in. So we use the term and, uh, strategic as uh, commissions of classes, which is the maximum representation of the class with the directory uh, of YMCA and their departments, besides professional sports uh, with uh, ages from 30 to 50 years old. We have uh, some representatives, four or five associates of ours, with a uh, great will to serve and to support the professional, understanding that he commands the activities and that he can contribute to this. This commission has a very important role and it was the basis for the beginning of uh, volunteer work in YMCA. The role of auxiliary in classes. This is very basic work, integrated, integrate new associates, uh, commemorate birthday, extra activities. Sometimes uh, it's with, we do these things without the strategy in a voluntary committee, with your, com with your unit. So YMCA uh, seeks to make this uh, very professional, leading, dealing with volunteers. How to identify a volunteer or an associate uh, with a tendency to volunteer. He's very communicative, he's willing to work with equipment in class, he's very quick, very agile, he's close to the, to the monitors, and he uh, exerts a certain leadership, and this is something very important. Our monitors, our professionals, they perceive very quickly the contribution that this commission, that these volunteers uh, can give us in, in uh, their careers in YMCA. Uh, basically, there, we have a very important analysis in this Masdo pyramid of the needs and as of what, what period uh, a person is okay to uh, to play the role of a volunteer in an institution so an analysis and this pyramid uh, taking away the basic needs physiological safety and survival i believe uh, strongly that if you can conceive a voluntary group that is very strong, and practically this is our last slide, uh, these are the voluntary groups within uh, YMCA associates. Uh, there are areas in which we work with uh, youngsters, the beginning of development, our youngsters that are very active in physical education since it is our strongest area. Uh, and it's an area in which I act uh, and is, it's very structured in a multidisciplinary concept so that you can give the best quality. Uh, this is interesting. YMCA has a service club such as Lions. The worldwide YMCA has a, a service club which are volunteers that uh, uh, attend us in social uh, voluntary work. We reach the, uh, the dirt directory and the board of directors, we consider this a career. And in this sense, and for self-realization, this is a criteria for a calling, uh, for a contribution uh, to your next, uh, to the community and to the world. We have to leave uh, ourselves uh, so that we can give uh, a true contribution and YMCA feels very safe in engaging in several projects, uh, public policies, YMCA is, is in the collegiate of uh, Agita São Paulo. 
prazer incrível. Eu It's particularmente a great pleasure. muito por isso. Acho que foi quase um ano uh, para nós conseguirmos for filiar. Us to, uh, é, to, uh, são desafios que nós uh, temos que uh, These are challenges we have to give to the, né, the uh, que nós temos. community. Acho que nós With these battalion of volunteers, I believe we are prepared to act at any moment in great events, in great big proposals, such as the ones that are appearing every day for uh, physical activity. I would like to thank the opportunity of being here. I hope uh, I have contributed. I am available for any questions later on. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Marco Antônio. Obrigado, Marco Antônio. Thank you very much, Marco Antônio, for your words, for bringing all this important information. It allowed us to have an idea of such an important institution that we have in Brazil and that embraces voluntary work. It's always good to expand our knowledge about this topic and YMCM here in Brazil. Now I pass the floor to Karen Kiwen from Girls Sports Program, United Kingdom. She is the national manager for the girls' sports. It's offered by Active Women Consortium and headed by UK Sports Charity Street Games, with the goal to include women from 14 to 28, 25 years old in the practice of physical education. She worked at the governmental, governmental agencies for the development of sports and development and implementations of several sports for all programs, including sports action zones and active communities. She acts on the social development and inclusion through sports for over 25 years. So, Karen, you have the floor. Hi there. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here to, to share my experience, really, of work, working in the UK. In my presentation, I'm going to cover three areas. I'm going to talk about street games, who we are and what we do. I'm going to talk about uh, an event which we staged in London um, a couple of months ago. You may, you may have heard of it, um, London 2012. And I'm going to talk about how we connected our volunteers to that event to make the most of, of, of the games. And then, finally, I'm just going to talk about some of our priorities for the future. So, who we are. Um, we're Street Games. We're a national sports charity, so we're a voluntary organisation. We focus on areas of, of... We focus on young people from areas of disadvantage, and we've worked with... Um, young people aged 14 to 25. We've got a very simple vision, which is about changing sport, and we do that by influencing... In the UK, sport is provided by what the national governing bodies of sport, so we try and influence um, the governing bodies to make sure that sports which are provided meet the need of disadvantaged young people. We work in communities, and um, we work in uh, 200 different communities across the UK, and we provide support to the, the organisations there to help them deliver excellent programmes. And most importantly, we also change lives. We, we, we sort of value the young people working in our programmes and we create opportunities for the young people to really make a difference for them. So, what we do, we I mean, there's been lots of terms um, sort of spoken about in the last couple of days, grassroots sports, sport for all. And I'm afraid we've developed a new one, so sorry, sorry about that. We have what we call doorstep sport. Now, that may, may not sort of project to, to you very well, but doorstep for us is about local. It's about being in the heart of communities. And it's very, again, really very simple, straightforward stuff. It's about providing sport at the right place, the right time, the right, the right style, um, just very, the, getting it right uh, at every level. But, but key, and what I'm going to focus on really in the, the presentation, is about um, youth action and making sure that our programmes are, are driven by the needs of the young people. But I just want to focus on the state of play in the UK in terms of who is volunteering and who isn't volunteering. The, the graph you can, you can see um, as is basically taken from a survey across the whole of the United Kingdom to find out um, who is volunteering. 
The graph is looking at um, young people aged 16 to 24. The, the black line in the, in the, the black block in the middle represents the average um, vol volunteering rate. And then the areas which are highlighted as red are the, the, the groups of people who are volunteering more than, than the, the, the average. So you can see the groups of people who are volunteering are high-income young people and males. So they tend to get involved in voluntary work. Whereas on, over to the, the, the uh, side coloured blue, they're the people who are not getting involved in volunteering, and it's um, low-income young people and females. So that, that, it really does echo people who are taking part in sport, and so we need to work with the, the participants and converting them into um, volunteers. So we have two kind of simple, um, standardised approaches. They're not models, they're just ways we try and develop our young people into volunteers. So very much driven from within our communities. We don't have people coming from out different communities into um, activities. We, have, we develop our own people, youth-led. So we work with players who are committed. We help them become uh, helpers. They, they assist at sessions. We help them become qualified in leadership training. We then help that get them helping to deliver sessions. We get them qualified in, in different courses. And then they become the volunteer who we can rely on. They turn up, they deliver the sessions for us, and ultimately they become the face of the programme and the people other people relate to and look up to. That's the traditional sort of sports volunteer model. What we've also found is that some, some people are less inclined to want to be the leader of a session, the coach um, so we've developed a sports motivator pathway whereby this tends to work quite well with girls as well where they, they, their self-esteem is lower and we need to create a different pathway for them. Again, we're starting from the participant, the committed, the committed participant, turning them into a supporter so they've got a really positive attitude towards physical activity. And this is where the pathway becomes a little bit different in that we want these people to be opinion um, formers shape opinions of other people, promote programs, be a consultee. They'll use social media, they'll be on Twitter, they'll be on Facebook, they'll be talking to their, their friends and they'll be encouraging people to be active through their advocacy of our programs. And again, they'll become the, the face of the program. A little bit about who the programs we set up and the partners we work with now. Underpinning the activity which I've described is um, a training programme. So we have a number of uh, three-hour short courses for, our, for the people across the country to um, develop their expertise and skills and be able to work with volunteers. So we have an, an advanced um, uh, set of training products to, to help people with um, developing uh, young people as volunteers. We also have um, an events and festival programme, which is really large across the country. We have mass participation festivals and local festivals. And they're really important for us because they are often the place where the young people go in their first experience of being a volunteer, a leader or a helper. So having somewhere where they want to go and do that work is, is, is vital. Girls' participation, obviously, is... We've talked about um, the sort of the... The, the lack of representation from girls volunteering, and we put a large programme in to, to get girls um, participating and becoming volunteers, um, and that is sort of really key to what we do. And then the sort of the final programme there is encompasses all, all we do in that it's about young volunteers at the heart of all um, the programmes we deliver. The, the partners we work with. Uh, we have, we're really fortunate in that we have Coca-Cola Great Britain as a major sponsor for our work. And they are absolutely fantastic. Um, they provide um, monetary value. But more, more importantly, the opportunities they create through their, their networks is fantastic. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The cooperative won't mean a lot to you, but it's a national um, supermarket chain uh, across the UK, and they back the work we do because they really value the young, young sort of um, investing in young people. We have funding from health, so health have recognised, health bodies have recognised that the work we do cuts across sport and health, so we have a lot of support from health funders. And we have, we're very fortunate in the UK in that we have a lottery 
a sports lottery program um, which has, is holding up really well in, in time of recession and uh, provides a good amount of funding for us as well. I'm going to talk a little bit now about London 2012 and the experience we've just had in London, um, which obviously you've got you know, an Olympic Games and a World Cup coming up. And I can't um, sort of emphasise enough how you need to absolutely grab hold of those um, experiences. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we made sure the experiences are volunteers connected to the Games. Because if you don't do something, you, the, the connection won't happen. And the thing which we probably underestimated um, for London was the torch relay. Um, so the torch relay ran for 70 days across the United Kingdom. And the, I, the, the, the sort of hundreds of thousands of people were turning up in the streets day and night to sort of cheer the torch on its journey. What we were fortunate in doing is we got 50 young people who had a, had a chance to run with the torch. And for those people, it was an absolute life-changing experience. So it took us by surprise, the torch relay. We weren't anticipating the country to be so captivated by it. So my advice to you is really get a hold of that torch relay and get your, the people you work with to have the, the opportunity if you can. We, we were fortunate with the work Coca-Cola do as a, as a game sponsor in that 50 of our young people um, from the street games programs actually had a games time role. So they worked for eight weeks. Uh, you've, the picture there is of three of the volunteers who um, worked for eight weeks at, at the games um, as part of the Coca-Cola family. And interestingly, they, they were paid for that work as well. They, they all sort of put, put themselves forward as volunteers, but Coca-Cola wanted to recognise their work and paid them. And sort of last, the last um, thing we did as an organisation, we were really conscious that although London 2012 tried hard to make ticket prices low so that um, the games were accessible, but people from our communities weren't all going to be able to get to London. The UK isn't a massive country, but still getting, getting to London was a barrier. So we, a very, again, very simple scheme, um, we called it Give and Go, where we approached corporate um, companies to try and get them to don donate financially, which they did, and then we created a pot of money, which then we, we get, gave out, we bought tickets, we were, on, we were sort of in the ballots, we were all over the place buying tickets up and our, our aim was to get our, our young people, our volunteers to be able to experience um, the, the games and we managed to get 1,800 young people to um, London 2012 at no cost to, to them. Um, the pictures there just represent some of the people who had that fantastic experience at London 2012 but again, it, a bit of advice we needed to create the opportunity to get um, young people to experience London 2012. So, just in, in summary, um, what's next for us? We, in the UK, we have a, a recession and there's a, sort of huge fears around youth unemployment. And so key to what we're, we're doing now is making sure our young people get the chance to... Um, have sports apprentice schemes and find a route into employment. So we're working up a national programme of sports apprentice um, programmes to get help young people into work across the UK. Also in the UK, um, as part of the recession, is um, we've, we've introduced um, tuition fees for, for young people wanting to go to university, again, which is a deterrent for the young people we work with. And they're not going to, you know have that, that financial backing behind them. So we're looking at ways to make all the qualifications and the training we do sort of validated so it helps them be able to get to university and then give advice around bursaries. And, and finally, having sort of experienced London 2012 and the power the Games does have to change lives, we're keen to do a bit more of that, really. Um, we're, we're fortunate that um, we have the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow in 2014, so we'll be doing the similar sort of things we did with London 2012 for, for Glasgow 2014. But we're also, don't know how we're going to do it yet, we've called it the Road to Rio 2016, and we would love to find out how we can make the young people in the UK have a way of accessing you know, the fantastic experience um, of, of, of uh, Rio de Janeiro in 2016. 
as a real life-changing experience for those young people. So <clears throat> that is the work we, we do um, day in, day out. We did have the advantage of having London 2012. Um, you have that advantage as well. And just grasp it. It is absolutely amazing. It, will change, it changes sport. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you. Thank you, Karen, for your words and new ideas, your inspirations that you brought to us for the next Olympics here in Brazil in relation to the use of uh, volunteer work. We now pass the floor to Alan Williams, Sports for Social Change Network, Southern Africa. He's regional coordinator for Sports for Social Change Network in South Africa, responsible for ensuring the uh, efficient management of strategic and operational aspects in the region of Southern Africa in collaboration with partners and the directory of SSCN was nominated and elected as Clinton Democracy Fellow and Ashoka Fellow in 2005 and 2006. We pass the floor to Alan now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> uh, this is the MOVE conference, so if I see anybody sleeping, I'm going to throw some water on you guys, okay? So, can you stand? Stretch a bit. <laughs> We're in a MOVE conference. <laughs> okay, that's good. You can stand for the entire presentation. I'm not going to be long. Or you can sit. You can choose. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm from an organization called Sport for Social Change Network Southern Africa. Uh, it was really started by Nike. We have an office in Brazil called REMS. We have one in Argentina, one in the United Kingdom, one in Southern Africa, which I'm the hub coordinator for, one in East Africa, and one in the United States. Uh, so I'm really honored to be here today. Thank you to the organizers, Iska and Sesk. And um, so I'm not an expert in this, but I'm going to my, I'm give you my best shot at, at this. Uh, I'm going to talk about, um, first of all, how many NGOs are represented here? Civil society. Can, can I see your hands? Wow, a few, okay. How many use volunteers? A few, okay, thank you. So I, um, I wanna talk about really quickly about the history of, of volunteerism uh, and, the, and then also the challenges facing uh, civil society and NGOs. Um, and then I want to talk about um, volunteerism really con using, using it in the context of South Africa um, and then also looking at how we can fully utilize volunteers uh, because we know as, as non-government organizations it's very difficult uh, to bring on people to pay salaries. You know, South Africa is quite similar to Brazil. There's a lot of unemployment, especially youth unemployment. And so we really need to look at how volunteers from volunteerism, how it has started to where it is now, and, and also to pose the question that, you know, can we redefine what a volunteer is all about? So, so as my colleague said, you know, uh, the word volunteer really was coined in 1755. It means one who offers himself for military service. Uh, during that time, there was a very little uh, charitable organizations uh, that, were, that were there. And it was also during this time that America experienced the, the Great Awakening. Uh, there was also a sense of consciousness for the poor and for the disadvantaged. Um, you know, then the cause for the movement against slavery was, was, was realized. And then also young people also got involved in, in volunteerism. Um, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you, but I don't know if that is right, sir. But in 1851, 
the YMCA in the United States was, was founded. And then also the Salvation Army, which is one of the largest and oldest organizations working with disadvantaged people. Um, and they have a number of volunteer organizations around the world. Let's look at some of the, the challenges that are facing NGOs. Uh, we, we speak about the global crisis. If there's a problem in the United States, it affects everybody around the world. We see what's happening in Europe, in, in Greece, and we see all the challenges that are facing us. So, so at street level, any cash uh, translates into less services for abused women and children. Um, NGOs had to let go of many staff members as well. Um, NGOs are feeling the pinch, so they have to reduce. Um, Nonprofits in the United States estimate that net giving was down by 20%, and it looked like it, it would be worse as well going into the future. Uh, funders are not able, so funding organizations are not able to support our work, right? Nike, Adidas, you name it, all the big brands, whatever, because they have to start looking at themselves first. So NGOs really need to become very creative in how they work in the future. Let's talk about volunteering in, in South Africa. South Africa has a history of volunteerism, um, especially during the apartheid era. A lot of organizations was really started in South Africa by men and women that uh, they rallied around a need, you know? So there's a history of volunteerism in, in, in South Africa. Um, but there's also difference of experiences and outlook uh, of volunteering. If you look at a volunteer in South Africa now, compared to a volunteer in Europe or the United States, it's very different. Because in developed countries, you know, it's an opportunity for young people to go abroad, to learn, to take a gap year. In South Africa, it's different. A volunteer is somebody that's, that's really looking at putting bread at the end on the table and looking at survival. So any form of stipend or money uh, would, would help. So there is a difference between volunteering in South Africa as opposed to volunteering anywhere else in, in the world. In, 20, in 2010, 1.2 million people aged 15 years and older participated in volunteering in South Africa. 64.2% of the volunteers were women and 35.7% were men. So it shows that women are better volunteers than men. Am I right? No. <laughs> it could differ from country to country. Uh, and then also, um, about 439,000 individuals volunteered through organizations, while 642,000 uh, volunteers did it individually, meaning they themselves just went and volunteered uh, on their own. Over 89% of volunteers were involved in one a volunteer activity. The rate of volunteering was higher among women than among men in all ages, except among those aged 65 years and older during the, the reference period. The volunteer rate increased with age up to the age of 45 to 54 years, after which it declined. The, okay, the black African and the Indian Asian populations had volunteer rates lower than the national average, while the white and colored populations had volunteer rates higher than the national average of 3.5%. Individuals who were married or those who were living together like husband and wife were more likely to volunteer than those who were, were never married. Persons with higher levels of education engaged in volunteer activities at a higher rates than those with lower levels of education. So, there's a statistics that show that uh, if you look in, on the middle, it, it shows that, you know, uh, in that age group 45 to 54, that's the highest group for, for volunteering. Uh, and as you can see, women are, are, are the highest as well. So these are all things that to think about when you're looking for volunteers, who are the right people that you can go and, and speak to. Um, in terms of race in South Africa, the white population were far more volunteers than any other group uh, in South Africa. Um, right, so let's look at redefining what volunteerism means in South Africa. 
Uh, in South Africa, we face a lot of socioeconomic challenges, such as crime, unemployment, education, HIV and AIDS. One of the main influences of the redefinement of volunteering in South Africa is youth unemployment. We have huge unemployment uh, issue in South Africa. Um, the, the current standing of unemployment is 24.9% and 48.2% of that is young people in South Africa. People needing jobs. So how do we create a win-win situation for the volunteer, for the organization, as well as uh, 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 for, um, for the beneficiaries? Let's look at two approaches. We've got a top-down approach where we're looking at retired professionals, uh, current or retired sport personalities, corporate workers uh, from the sport and health sectors. And then we've got a bottom-up approach where we've, talking about South Africa, we've got unemployed youth, and then obviously we've got university students, students that are studying sport, sport or, development, or, or development work. So let's look at the, the top-down approach. These are some of, uh, this is some of the value that they bring. Uh, you've got, sometimes in your organization you might not have uh, professionals to bring some professional work, such as uh, legal services, project management, business development, fundraising or IT, communication or PR. But there's always what we find is that you'll find that there's a lot of retired CEOs or professionals that really want to give back to organizations. Those are the right guys that you need to go and speak to and try and find to see how they can come back into your organization and then also add, add value. They bring with them a lot of skill as well. And, you know, they don't want to go sit in some old age home and retire or take, go to Rio and live on the beach. They want to get involved and do some work as well. So by you letting them know what you do, they can come into your organization and they can add value. Um, they're also very really good because over the years, they've built up uh, quite a good network. So if he's a CEO of a bank, he knows possibly the CEO of another bank who's probably still in you know, still, still working. So what they can do is that they can make contacts for you to open doors somewhere else. Um, and then also, uh, for the retired professional, there's a, there's a sense of giving back to society. And then um, it's, it's also for him, like I said, it's a new venture opportunity. He doesn't have to sit back and, and kick back. Uh, for the sport personalities, there's a, I'm sure in Brazil there's a number of sport personalities. I'm talking specifically for, in our sector, sport for development. You know, when you bring them to your organization, they, they add credibility for, for your organization. And that could translate into, into res, resource mobilization, uh, in-kind or funding. Um, what they also do is that they also raise the profile of your organization. They can be used as a good marketing tool for your organization, uh, a great ambassador, and they have a passion for sport. Now let's look at the other way, uh, which, is, which is, oh, still, sorry, still top down. Here we have a, you can also approach a number of uh, corporates. There's, um, we speak about, like the lady spoke about, my colleague spoke about Coca-Cola. It's not just about asking them to give your money into your organization, but maybe what you can do is ask them to give some of their, vo uh, their workers on a Friday to come and volunteer in your organization. By doing that, what you're doing is that you're opening your doors and you're allowing them to come in to see, and for them kind of to take ownership and buy into the vision of your organization. And, and that could translate into, into, into bigger things uh, down the line. So, uh, and then often, like, within Nike in South Africa, every volunteer that goes to volunteer at the organization, they also bring, uh, for, the, for the amount of time they spend in your organization, money is given for, for that time as well. So that's really the top-down approach. Let's look at the bottom-up approach of volunteers. I spoke about unemployed youth, and I'm sure that in Brazil or in anywhere else in the world you have unemployed young people, am I right? So there's this great pool of, of, of people, but, but it's, it's so unfair. We can't, 
I don't know about you, but we can't ask people to volunteer when they themselves are struggling. You understand? People just want to get by on a daily basis and survive. So we need to be smart about how we utilize this, this, this pool of volunteers uh, called this unemployed young people. So there's various ways. I mean, you know, it's cheap, cost-effective services to the organization. They can, use, they can use the opportunity to... You can also, in South Africa, we, we have a learnership program where what we do is that you as the organization provide the, um, the, the practical work. You can bring in a government institution that can provide the theoretical work. So call it community development practice. So you can structure a program around that where one week they, they're learning about community development practice and the next week they're busy in your organization uh, doing the, the practical side of it. So it's kind of on-the-job training as well. Um, so, and it's also job creation for, for young people. So they're coming through to your organization and you're providing jobs for them at the end of the day. Um, and then you also, you can accompany that by a, by a stipend, a monthly stipend. And then lastly, you've got university students. Go to them and ask them to provide some of their, their skill within your organization as well. Some of them would love to do their practical work within your organization. So in conclusion, I have no doubt that, uh, that NGOs need to be more creative uh, to remain relevant. Uh, but one thing you do need is a good strategy. Um, there's a lot of money out there, there's a lot of time, uh, and there's a lot of people willing to support your organizations. So be smart about how you go about this and ensure that you get the right person. The results eventually can, can translate into your organization's longevity and greater impact in society. But you need to have a strategy. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you very much, Alan, for your words and for bringing us some of the reality of Southern Africa regarding the topic that's missing being discussed here today, which is voluntary work. Uh, our speakers have been very correct as the time of their speeches now. I pass the floor to our last speaker, Simone Di Gennaro, who is a researcher of the Cassino University in Italy. He is also researcher of the movie project of ISCA, and he is responsible for the collection of good practices in this project. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. As you can see uh, from the title, perhaps the, the topics. Hello? The topics could be a, a little bit boring, especially because I'm the last speaker. So, this is, this is the reason why I would like to, to change a little bit my approach. And uh, you are going to discover how. I hope you will enjoy it. I hope so. So before turning to the, to the main part of my presentation, I would like to tell you a story. Uh, it's a long story. This is the reason why I have some notes with, with me, because I need to, to resume. The time at disposal is really short, so I will try to, to resume this story. And uh, here's the story. Actually, it's uh, uh, an old story. It's a story about biology. That biology is a, like a sort of world in which the firstest, the strongest, can survive. Business survives only by defeating and dominating competition. And politics, it's your side winning at all costs. Doesn't matter. We need to win. Uh, do you know him? Who is him? Darwin. Okay, so we, we have a, an native sense of competition. Because we need to compete for surviving. 
as it, is, it has been well explained by Darwin in its idea of the struggle for life. At the same time, do you know them? Flintstones, yes. At the same time, we have a, a native sense of uh, cooperation. Because we, we took part, oh sorry, because uh, uh, we need to cooperate. And in the past, we lived in a small group family, as Flintstones. In the past, we were Flintstones. But at a certain point, we don't know exactly when, we decided to enlarge this cooperation with other groups because we started hunting bigger animals. Perhaps we, because we were a little bit, I don't know, hungry or starving. And we wanted to eat a little bit more. We don't know when it happens, but uh, we know that the, this aspect is a, a crucial issue for the development of our society. Because we started cooperating and we enlarge our network and we enlarge our community. And this is an important part. Uh, don't worry, you are going to discover how this story is related to the topic. <laughs> I hope so, at least. Um, so, until recently, the, innovative, uh, the, sorry, the native sense of competition was dominating. But what I want to say is that today there is the beginning of a new story, something that is changing, and something that is impacting our society, and uh, we can also say the sports system. It's a narrative that spread across a number of different disciplines and different sectors. And of course, also the sports system is involved. And from a sociological point of view, the sport system and the sport is like a sort of mirror to understanding, to analyzing our society. So, here it comes to the point, or at least I hope so. As I said, we have two different senses, two different native senses. The sense of competition and the sense of cooperation. And I think it can be well represented if you think about, just for a second, uh, the Olympic Games, some picture from, from London. You can see the two sides. Competition. Athletes need to compete. They want to win. They training. They want to achieve their medal. They hope for a gold medal. Silver is quite good. Then it's, it's going to be a little bit... Uh, Let's, uh, how can I say, good, yeah, good perhaps is the, last, uh, the right term. The other side, you can see the part in which we demonstrate our sense of cooperation, volunteers. And this is the topic, this is the focus of my presentation. As uh, it has been well uh, described by the other colleagues, volunteerism is the pillar of our sports system. It's the pillar of each sports system. Without voluntarism, for instance, big events, like the events that you are going to organize, are a little bit complicated, because you need the support of a lot of people. Without volunteers, without volunteers, you cannot have such a kind of big events. And of course, volunteers are important also for the grassroots level, for the sport for all level. So again, uh, volunteerism and volunteers are an important part of the sport system. And now we come to the boring part. I'm a researcher. I have to be boring. Because they pay me for being boring. Sorry for that. Uh, this is the boring part. Why people decide to volunteer? We have some insight about that already. There are a lot of theory, a lot of model, a lot of explanation. Here I try to resume some factors. Of course, there are a lot. It's not possible today to underline these specific issues. Perhaps I can decide to volunteer because I have a personal interest. A nice girl is volunteering there. And I would like to join her. Uh, 
another aspect could be related to the social aspect, uh, social benefit, sorry, or in terms of social responsibility. I really believe that it's important that have to support my, my community. I want to be active. I want to impact my community. So I decided to volunteer. By volunteer, instead of uh, attending the training courses of the university, that is a little bit sad for me because we need students at the university, otherwise they can be fired. But that's life. So what is important is this aspect. Learning by doing. By being involved, involved as a volunteer, I can learn, I can gain new knowledge, new skills, new competence. So we have a big challenge. If it's true what I'm saying, and please say yes, it's true, we have a big challenge because we need a process, a system, of a framework, whatever you want, something that can help us to define a process of validation of non-formal and informal learnings. If I'm volunteering, and for instance, I'm volunteering as project manager, it could be possible, and I'm learning something, I'm gaining skills, I'm gaining competence, who and how is going to demonstrate, to validate that, yes, I'm good in that kind of tasks, because I have experience, because I'm working on these on, on this specific topics, on these specific uh, fields. Well, uh, before uh, explaining you how it could be possible, we have a good experience. Uh, we have uh, an interesting att attempt that uh, the European Union is trying to implement. I would like to underline that, of course, uh, if, we can, if we can manage to have uh, this clear process of validation, we are going to have a lot of impacts at individual levels. Because try to think about this aspect. I can be a student at the university, or I can, I, perhaps I'm attending a training course. And at the same time, I'm volunteering in a sport organization. And, but the training course that I'm attending is about, uh, I don't know, project management. And is this the same things that I'm doing within my organization or within another organization? In a perfect world, the agency that is providing the course can say, hey, you are doing something that is relating to, uh, to the topics that we are discussing about, that we are proposing to you. So perhaps uh, you already have uh, some kind of skills, sometimes on comp competence, some, uh, sorry, some kinds of competence. So perhaps we can change a little bit our approach. We can change a little bit the training that we are providing because uh, perhaps it could be better for you. And we can, all, we can avoid what we call overqualification or we can avoid to duplicate learning process. And of course, we can have a, a better impact on an individual level, because in this way, the two systems are well balanced and are integrated. Of course, in this way, you can also have a, an impact uh, for the organization. Because uh, if I have to select people for my organization, if I have a system that clearly demonstrates the knowledge and the skills that the person that is in front of me has because he's attending or because he got uh, an university degree, but at the same time because he worked or he served as a volunteer for 10 years, then I can find the right person with the right competence, with the right skills for my organization. Because I need that kind of competence, that, time, that, that kind of skills and that kind of knowledge. So you can have a huge impact, but as you can imagine, it's not simple. The model. <laughs> a researcher needs model. <laughs> Sorry for that. It's the only one. This is my model. Actually, it's not my model. It's coming from the literature. But it's the, it's the model that I like. It's a little bit complicated, but I would like to explain it shortly. We have the two system. Do we have the pointer here? No, doesn't matter. We have the two system. Try to follow me. See my hands. Okay? 
see, yeah? <laughs> the upper part of the model, you have the, the formal system. Let's say the university, for instance. You get into uh, a study program. You have a lot of assessment, exams, and a lot of things that it seems help us to understand the level of knowledge and the level of skills that you have. And then at the end of this process, you can get your certificate. That is the end of the process. As you can see, there, there is standards. It means that the, at national level, generally speaking, or sometimes also at regional level, there is a framework, something that can help us to have a bridge between the different systems. And so I know that if you have in degree, a degree in sports science, I presume that you have a certain kind of competence, a certain kind of skills, and so on and so on. The other system is the non-formal system. It's a little bit different, because this formal system is about your personal activities, and it also is about, uh, in our, like in our case, volunteerism. We need more or less the same things. We need an identification of knowledge, skills, and competence. That is not easy, because we need to provide what we call documentations, Evidence that can demonstrate that, yes, you are following a learning by doing process and you are gain, gaining certain kind of competence and skills. And then we need a process of validations. As you can see, the error is closely related with what, what I underlined before, the standard system. Because, of course, we need connection between these two systems. We need to use the same language. Otherwise, it doesn't work. If you can try to imagine a system that integrates these, these two levels, then you have the perfect world. You have a world in which what are you doing in your daily life is recognized, and then it's related with your training and educational path. And it's perfect. How is it possible to do that? Well, it's a little bit complicated. But there are some tools, for instance. I, I know the experience coming from the European Union. I don't know how is the situation here. But for instance, the European Union is trying to define what is called the European Qualification Framework by using different tools. I'm going to, about, uh, I'm going to discuss about these tools. Unfortunately, we don't have time. But what is interesting is this attempt of the European Union. Each, member, uh, each country as a specific system concerning education and training. And of course, each country is independent. What it's trying to do, the European Union, is, okay, you are independent, but let's try to find a way that can create bridge among the different education and training system. In this way, if I got a degree in sports science in Italy, then if I move to Denmark or if I move to Germany, they recognize my experience, my knowledge and my skills, and I'm free to work there. It's a dream, perhaps, but there are some levels, uh, some evidence, and also there are good attempts. And uh, the European Union is trying to define this model by the end of the 2014. So perhaps by the end of 2014, we are going to have an European qualification framework that help us to move freely among the different countries in Europe, having the same opportunity to work. And that's quite positive, it's very important. But beside these tools, there is another aspect, and this is my last slide, I promise you, that is important if you want to really create this kind of European qualification framework or if you want uh, another kind of a qualification framework. And I think uh, these key issues, this is something tangible, is well represented by uh, that picture. I don't know if you can see it. There are ladies that are trying to uh, 
I don't know how to explain it, but you can understand, just you see there, it's like a sort of task. And uh, it's not possible to achieve, uh, it's not possible to, to realize that kind of task without uh, the aspect that is, I think is really crucial. And it's the, as the aspect of cooperation. Without cooperation, what they are doing is impossible. And I think this is the key words that um, resume a little bit my presentation. Cooperation is the, the key words if you want to find a system that can help people to have a better life because uh, they can have a, a better training and educational path. And that's a very important for the individuals and also for the society. Cooperation must be uh, related to individuals, but also to stakeholders, what we call stakeholders, and also to the different uh, system that are implemented at national level. Of course, we, know we also need uh, cooperation within the sports system. Uh, that was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy it, and uh, I'm ready for your questions. <laughs> and critics. Thank you for the information that you brought to us. We will now pass on to, we have several questions, very interesting questions from the audience. I uh, will start by a question that was made to Marco Antonio, but I open as well to the panel for the other speakers that wish to uh, answer the question as well. The, f the question is this, is the voluntary work in sports in Brazil is incipient. In your opinion, what, I what, uh, what is uh, needed to have more volunteers in this area? Uh, many people use voluntary work uh, to get to places where they want to work. He asks, uh, can you comment on this theme? Well, as I understand the issue here, uh, first of all, the uh, it's a matter of uh, reuniting the institutions that have in their DNA and their core mission the vocation uh, uh, structuring volunteer work to serve on these great events, these big events that, or any intervention in several areas, uh, especially in physical activity. Uh, so uh, these institutions have to potentialize the um, volunteer work and put their in, put it in their planning, uh, flexibilize their budget. I understand here today that there are several projects here, and I understand how it worked uh, in the Olympics in 2012, United Kingdom. The the torch uh, was something that uh, moved me. I'm trying to visualize this here in our institution. Our last uh, presentation here also helps to answer this question. It's a matter of competency to want to have and to want to give some return to this. Particularly, I'm discussing the participation of youngsters in uh, the World Cup and Olympics. We have uh, YM MCA leaders uh, meeting. We have meetings from in Sao Paulo, Rio Grande do Sul, and we prioritize this issue of systems. So uh, the youngsters uh, discuss legacies. So we need what we need are attitudes here. Uh, thank you. I will remain in this theme that has to do with uh, voluntary work. We have uh, also also a specific question to Karen. Uh, the uh, question to the panel is, what strategy to maintain and motivate volunteers and the main challenges found by your institutions? And I didn't, quite, I didn't quite catch the question, sorry. I'll, I'll do it again. Um, 
how to motivate the volunteers and what are the main challenges found in this motivation. And I would like to uh, follow with a question, a specific question uh, directed to you that says that the theme uh, London 2012 was inspired generation. In this context, do you think that the voluntary work that in this voluntary work you were able to inspire a generation, how it would be to inspire a generation towards voluntary work? Wow, um, there's quite a few sort of questions in there. If I start first with how you, you continue to motivate um, your volunteers, I think um, I tried to describe the model we use with, with volunteering, and it's, it's a very subtle model where often, because um, we're growing up, we're growing um, young people from participants to volunteers. And they, for the first start part of that process, they don't even realize that they're becoming a volunteer. They're just gradually helping out a little bit more. Their, their confidence is growing. And then it might take many, many months before um, they feel confident to be able to go on a, 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 perhaps a course um, to gain sort of further skills. And then eventually... They'll, they'll be confident enough and they'll, they'll realise they're a volunteer. But it's, it's not a case of sort of going out to recruit volunteers. It's about the skills of the leaders locally, um, sort of, you know, nurturing those young people so that they become volunteers, often um, without them knowing it. So I don't know if that answers the, sort of the question about how you motivate volunteers. Um, then the, the issue about London 2012 and whether that inspired um, a generation of young people to be volunteers. Um, when people wanted to be volunteers at London 2012, when there was sort of a call out there to, if you wanted to be a volunteer at 2012, it was oversubscribed by 100, 100 times. Um, so there was a lot, a lot of people wanted to be volunteers. I think... Um, if you look at the cross-section of people who did become volunteers at London 2012, it was very varied. People from all walks of life, all ages, and that obviously was, was great. Um, I think if, if you looked really closely, um, you would perhaps find that maybe young people from disadvantaged areas, the area in which we work, um, would not necessarily come through that system sort of per se, really, to become a, a volunteer at London 2012, unless organizations do something differently. Um, we were lucky in that we had Coca-Cola support, so we were able to inspire young people to get a, a sort of a, a, a placement, so to speak, um, as a volunteer at 2012. But not everyone has that opportunity. But I think if you, in the planning stages now, in looking at volunteering and making sure it does inspire the generation for all young people, and not just the, the people who will, will sort of will flock to it, um, you need to start planning systems to make sure that you know, positive action is taken to make sure the games are accessible for all volunteers and not just the people who want to get the lovely experience of being a volunteer. Uh, would anyone like to share their experience on motivation in their countries? Uh, just to contribute to the answer, um, uh, the issue of planning, the issue of uh, uniting your volunteers. Let me take a model from YNCA for youngsters. This is the reason of leaving for the institution. Tomorrow we'll, we will have an event, and I invite you all, if I may. We uh, were having an event in Pinheiros uh, in partnership with FENAC. And we will be speaking about a great uh, market opportunity, which is the social networks. Tomorrow, the youngsters will be united with the, in, with the internet available in that square and discussing cases in social networks with four speakers, four keynote speakers that are ex-YMCAs that were parts of their physical activities. And these youngsters will have this perception. They will discuss seven uh, points of case
basis for um, social networks connected with the world. Uh, so it's an investment that the institution is doing with some support from some companies, but it is, it is a path it's a channel for entrance of people and ideas for uh, great events such as Olympics and the World Cup. The youngsters are eager to uh, receive this welcome. So it's a way to act together. These are the main ideas. I, I personally think that to motivate volunteers, it, it's, a, it's a personal thing, you know. Um, so it's, it's really about the individual themselves being motivated themselves to really want to give up their, their time. If you look at, for me, some of the great volunteers over the, the years, people like Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, or Nelson Mandela, all started out by rallying behind a, a course. So one of the things, it, sh it must be a passion on the inside of you that you want to do something. You must believe in that thing that you are serving. It's about being selfless, you know? So it's about, it's about the individual trying to change the mindset about just being, looking in what I can get out of it, but it's about laying your life down for your brother or your sister or for the cause. That's the one way that you can look at it. The other way is, is by really uh, inspiring young people uh, to dream, to think big, and to look at this experience uh, as, a, as a stepping stone to greater things in the future. So those are the two areas that I think we can inspire and motivate our young people. Okay, I can try to answer as a researcher. I don't have a direct experience in this kind of fields. What I want to say is that people want to volunteer because they want to achieve a, a rewards. No way to say something different. Rewards can be, of course, something intangible. Like, for instance, I want to volunteer because I want to feel like a, a good person. And this is a good reward for me. Or, for instance, uh, I want to volunteer because I want uh, something more specific as a reward. Because if uh, I volunteer for a wine and sport organization, perhaps tomorrow I can be the president or I can be the project manager, project manager for that organization. Uh, the point is that today, uh, people that want to uh, volunteer are more demanding. They need something more. Because we are witnessing a process that uh, we call in sociology of professionalization. It means that the sport organization, as in our case, needs people that have more skills and more competence than in the past. So, people that are volunteers are more prepared, are more trained, uh, are more, uh, have more skills and competence than people that were volunteering in the past. It, that means that the sport organization needs to offer something more in terms of rewards. And this is, of course, a challenge for sport organization. And this is also, uh, also uh, a request for sport organization to change a little bit strategy that they are adopting for, uh, for inviting people to volunteer. Okay. Uh, we, have, uh, we have several interesting questions. I have a question from Fernando uh, directed to Marco Antonio. Do you think, don't you think it's contradictory or complicated to talk about voluntaries for big events such as the World Cup, FIFA World Cup, when the institution and its members, in this case FIFA, uh, earn millions of dollars, especially uh, in uh, countries as, such as Brazil who have uh, many unemployed people? Uh, yes, uh, I agree uh, at, at the first. It's a uh, cultural exercise of the voluntaries. I think we have cultural gain. Let's forget the millions of dollars from FIFA and everything that will happen. Uh, uh, I have to care about the institution and the formation of our leadership, the process of training and follow-up, 
This will be a part of a legacy. What's important is what comes after the World Cup. This is what I say to the youngsters at YMCA, the continuity of what they will be doing, not only with the equipment, but with the feeling of having served something. Now, obviously, many projects uh, come to some or to add, such as Karen presented the idea that each company could uh, uh, make available three or four tickets for the Olympic Games, and these youngsters can manage this and use this in their community, uh, the need, more needy communities. This is a cultural exercise. It's a... Uh, issue of values, we know that their budgets, it's something a bit uh, crazy. And uh, still within this team, uh, with a question directed to all the board, all the panel, how to uh, equilibrate the with cheap labor. Okay. <laughs> How to equilibrate uh, the uh, opportunities given to volunteers with the image of uh, low uh, paying uh, for the services? Do, do, do you want me to make a, a, try and make a start on that? Uh, just from looking at, um, at the experience of London 2012, um, where you could say, you know, obviously loads of money in that and maybe it was cheap labour. Um, the, the, the people who wanted to be a part of that event, and like I say, from all walks of life, they never once saw that as I'm being exploited, I, someone should be there doing that, you know, I should be being paid for this, it's, it's, not, what, it's not right. Um, people really um, valued the ex experience to, to be part of once in a lifetime experience. So I think the value overweighed any feeling of sort of, oh, this isn't, this isn't right. And, that, and certainly in our country, there was never that debate about, oh, you know, why are these people volunteering and not getting paid? It just wasn't, it wasn't there in terms of a debate. It was, it was people were, felt really valued and really privileged to, to be a part of, a part of that, um, you know, that whole movement, really. Um, so it didn't hit. That debate did, did not surface in, for London 12, 2012. How many hours we have? <laughs> uh, it's not easy. Uh, what I want to say is that, of course, uh, uh, people are free to choice, and organizations are free. And uh, I don't see that there are specific rules or uh, uh, problems in using volunteers instead of using paid uh, operators. Of course, it's a big problem because sometimes uh, we use volunteers because we want to save money. Is it fair? I don't know. I don't have the, the, the right answer. What I can say is that uh, if, as a sport organization, I want to enhance the level of performance that uh, I want to provide to my members, for instance, or the, the quality of services that I'm, I want to provide to my uh, members, Perhaps I need people that are well prepared and people that are well trained. If we decided to have a, 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 an approach that tried to reach good standards, then perhaps I will be forced to use paid uh, operators because I assume that they have a, a higher level of competence and skill instead of volunteers. But perhaps it can be my personal choice. And uh, I can also say, no, no way. I need just medium standard and I want to use volunteers. I don't see that it's possible for states or governments to provide specific rules because, hey, guys, that's the market. I mean, uh, there is a labor market. And uh, as I said, uh, there is a struggle of, for life, but there, there is also a struggle for work. And uh, the best can win. Uh, perhaps it's not, uh, it's not fair, it's not, I don't know, we don't like this. But it's part of our daily life. If I can add another little thing, is of course, if we can have uh, what I try to 
present a system that can define and that can validate, that can describe the competence and skills that uh, a person has, then perhaps uh, it could be something more clear, clear because if uh, I am a member of a sport organization and I have in front of me a coaches and I have a clear definition on the competence that the, that coaches has, perhaps I can say, hey, this is not the right person for me and I can force, I can force a sport organization to change that person. Uh, now, a question that is connected with uh, uh, legal reasons. It's uh, one of my concerns that I'd like to put across. This question goes to Marco Antonio, but also uh, the panel members can give their opinion of what happens in your respective countries about the legal implications of voluntary work on mid and long term. Can it have uh, legal implications in terms of uh, labor suits? Is there any legislation that uh, defines voluntary work? And now I have something that concerns me which is the relationship of the physical uh, education professional and the volunteer. How does this topic is treated? Well, uh, yes, there is uh, legislation. Uh, YMCA has a legal department that uh, deals with all these legal aspects. We have our uh, bylaws and our regiment. And to have any activity having volunteers, you have to sign a term saying that you want to be a volunteer, and in this case, you are protected. Well, a volunteer dedicates eight to ten hours a day, and the, uh, somebody else is just once a week. Uh, the interpretation is difficult to see how much one works in comparison to other. Uh, for example, when, when you have this uh, uh, commission of uh, coaches association, for for example, they define voluntary work. Uh, they have from the simple ones until the most technical uh, works. I have nutritionists in my work that uh, uh, delivers uh, speeches in universities and, and others who just give a few hours training. So this is all legally protected. Uh, the, we've never had any kind of uh, lawsuit or any kind of uh, professional uh, or legal problems regarding this issue. The issue of uh, professionalism, of uh, uh, physical education, coaches and volunteers, uh, the, sometimes the clash between them. Well, it's never happened, I can tell you. This is a question that I've always asked myself. We know that there are uh, some big difficulties to have professionals of physical education, not only here in Sao Paulo, but if you take Brazil as a whole, all corners of Brazil, sometimes it's difficult to find people willing to go to that community and work there. So this is a, an issue that I've always had with me. I'm going to take this concern uh, with me. Uh, I know that uh, some people use the situation for their own advantages. So we need to reflect upon it and sometimes in, even intervene. I'm going to uh, work a lot in my new function, my new position, to try to identify and propose a solution for this problem. Thank you, Marco Antonio. Uh, we're about to finish. I'm just going to ask you the final question and ask our panel members to uh, express your final considerations. 
Uh, it's more a request than a question from Marco Antonio Sensri. I'd like to know if there is any institution that works just like uh, doctors without frontiers to work in natural catastrophes or refugees camps in the area of sports. He suggests the creation of sports without borders. If you are interested in the idea, get in touch with me. This is another suggestion to create something like sports without borders. And just to conclude, uh, the, this interesting question that was uh, sent to the panel, they say in South Africa, 70,000 volunteers worked, as, worked at the games in Brazil. 1,300 volunteers have enrolled. Well, if I make a mistake, you correct me to 130,000 volunteers, she says now. A record for a country without a volunteer work culture. We are hospital people and fans of fo football, soccer. I don't know if this, the spirit of the youngsters of the Y generation is so focused on acquiring new skills working for free. How to impact and convince this generation? generation about the benefits, how to lead this situation. So they say that in Pan American Games in Rio de Janeiro, of the 15,000 people enrolled, only 9,000 have shown. Uh, if you, do you have any uh, views or visions about this Y generation, about uh, young people today, how to convince them or telling them about the impact they'll have as volunteers? And then you can wrap up your considerations. So thanks for the question. Um, I just think that we need to inspire our young people. Uh, there's so much popular youth culture out there, uh, the rap stars, the fast life, the soccer players, um, and there's a lot of that, that, that in, but we need to inspire our young people. We need to tell stories about men and women that gave up their time uh, and their money selflessly to volunteer for a, for a specific cause. I know when I watched the movie of uh, Mother Teresa when she went to India and Calcutta and left the Catholic Church because she didn't get any support and she went into the favelas, the slum areas, and really to work. With, uh, with the poor, the sick, those that nobody wanted to work with, one person. Today, her organization is global. She gave off the time. She changed the world. We need to be, so we need to inspire young people with stories like that. If you look at Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States of America, um, the civil rights movement, who the famous speech, I have a dream, you know? If you look at all these people, if you look at Nelson Mandela, who gave up 27 years of his life to be in prison for a cause, we need to inspire young people. It's not just about getting an education, getting a job. If you're a soccer player going to play in Europe or going to World Cup, life is more about that. It's about, um, it's about making a difference. It's about making a change. So we need to inspire young people about the importance of why you need to volunteer, but it all starts with, with you, the individual. Thank you. Uh, quickly, uh, what I think is important, yes, I agree with you, of course, that's an, an important aspect. But then, uh, just, we are today living in the, in, uh, in the global village, as uh, McLuhan says, uh, but uh, we need we need to remind that a village is composed by by community, and so we need to regain uh, our sense of community. We have to act. We have to operate within our community, and uh, we have to remind. Of course, we have to inspire new generations. Say that if we can work at community level, then we can change uh, this global village in a positive way by impact by impacting individuals, but also society. 
It's not easy because you need a lot of things. You need the, the right strategy at political levels. You need the agency that work in an integrated way. Uh, you need, of course, also the support of individuals. You need a, a network that is both local and global. And uh, I think that this is the way, and I, see, uh, I can see that there are aspects and there are some uh, evidence of this new way to, to approach things at community level that are emerging, and this is very positive. Thank you. Can um, do you like to? Yeah, I'm going to sort of reinforce some of the, the same points already. Um, the work we do is very much, um, very, very slowly um, nurturing the young people, and it's all down to the skill of the, the, the local, well, for us we call them like project leaders, um, who are working with the young people day in, day out. And so the people, they're not, it's not like a big leap to become a volunteer. It just happens very, very gradually that they become more and more involved in the sports programs. And before they know it, they've, they've got the coach, they've got the, um, the hoodie which says, I am a coach. And they've been through a, a long journey. They've had the hand held all the way and they become that person they never thought they would be at the beginning because people are holding their hand all the way and encouraging them. Thank you, Carol. Marco Antonio. In relation to the first consideration, uh, the YMCA in Mexico and Tijuana has a project that works with uh, the sons or children or teenagers that uh, are in the border between Mexico and the United States in immigration and they stay there for uh, a while, sometimes a long time, and the youngsters do recreational sports with children. This is a great experience. We also, we always have two places that are very very sought it's not much what we pass uh, we have a lot of violence in our country uh, we cannot uh, make interventions such as is done in Medellin uh, it could be done here in, in Sao Paulo and Brazil this is a cultural aspect but the participation in conflict areas and cultural between two countries we have this project and it uh, pleases me very much. Uh, in regards to the question, I did not have the experience. Uh, we don't work this way for the youngster to enroll, to be a volunteer in the Pan American Games or the World Cup. Uh, we make a research and a few will uh, enroll to act as a volunteer. I believe they'll have a specific uh, purpose. I can't understand understand this very well, but I see the uh, parallel projects, I live this within the institution, and the way they organize to uh, work as volunteers in the World Cup, which is the example I gave. Uh, they will work with the YMCAs from the world, they will receive them at the airports, take them to the airports, the tourism part, the facilities to go to the to the stadiums and back, all of this parts. I understand the figures that are here, but uh, the projects attract me more. The Cub Scouts, the Boy Scouts are very young and they are also mobilized. And in relation to the success of these youngsters uh, through the, throughout these 28 years is leadership. So the youngsters want a reference, they want leadership. You have to find the right person for you to have an idea. My former supervisor that worked with youngsters here in Sao Paulo, he is in the World Alliance from YMCA in Switzerland, where the headquarters is, only developing uh, youngster politics, politics for young people. So uh, leadership is essential for these kind of projects. I thank uh, everyone present here today uh, for your contribution, for your questions. I apologize for those questions we weren't able to answer and I also thank the speakers for their inspiration for the future work
No futuro trabalho voluntário. Uh, future voluntary work. I invite everyone for poster sessions that will be in the square and our uh, closing session on the Congress later on. Thank you very much and good afternoon. We thank uh, Simone Genaro, Marco Antonio Olivato, Karen Keohan, Alan Williams, and the moderator Elizabeth Pauliello. We remind you that we will have uh, uh, an interval for the poster ses session and the uh, working market, and we will resume work in the theater with a journal uh, view of the move 2012. Good afternoon.